Hey guys, Super Pretzel Punch here. I wanted to make this video because I'm often asked, uh, what are some of your favorite music? Have you been reading any books? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about film and movies and all kinds of things. And I wanted to create this as a way that you guys can get a look at what has been interesting me lately. Now, this is a video that is not necessarily about things I've discovered for this month, but things that have been on my mind, things that I've enjoyed, and I want to pass on that to you to give you a little insight into who I am, my interests, my influence. Things that maybe don't get discussed on stream sometimes, uh, but I think that once you see it, you'll kind of get a better idea of who I am. Uh, and that's it uh awkward title so the first thing i want to talk about is a book i've been reading uh, a book that i picked up recently that i've been enjoying the hell out of is a book called crimes against logic by jamie white and what it is is basically a rather short and very approachable discussion about logical fallacies that appear in media and co like common discussion that you'll see, especially on Twitch. You'll, you know, I don't want to say get into arguments, but you'll get into debates and discussions with people and you'll hear a lot of common refrains and a lot of common uh, arguments back and forth. And what this book does is it breaks down and highlights a lot of logical fallacies that you sometimes hear people say. And I'm only about 25% of the way through it, and it's already given me uh, insight into ways that maybe I um, will sometimes shut down arguments with things I say, um, or catch myself making a diversion of the argument or making the argument about something else other than what we are arguing. And arguing doesn't mean anything belligerent and aggressive, Argument in the sense meaning I have a point, I'm trying to make it, I want you to give a counterpoint, and we can discuss that. Uh, the first example that they give in the book is debunking this idea that you'll sometimes hear from people uh, that everyone is entitled to their opinion. And the book does a very succinct uh, job at breaking that argument down by basically saying that the right to an opinion, number one, is false, and number two, that the um, that that does not actually address the argument being had, that it's basically a way of diverting the uh, the topic entirely. Um, immediately after that, they start talking about how you um, can't. Uh, judge or counter an argument based on the motivations of the person making the argument unless it involves testimony. Things like that. Uh, and it's really great. It's really amazing. Once you start reading it and start to really ingest it, you start to notice these things happening more and more and more and more in journalism, on Twitch, definitely, uh, and just in common discourse throughout your day. So it's a short read. Highly, highly recommend it. Please read it. It's so fascinating. And that way you can let me know if I do any of the things in the book. Next thing I'm going to talk about is a band that I really, really, really like. Uh, this band is called The Mountain Goats. I broke free on a Saturday morning. I put the pedal to the floor. Headed north on Mills Avenue. And listened to the engine roar. If you know me and you kind of know my tastes, I am very attracted to imperfection. And what I mean by that is um, a lot of people, especially when it comes to uh, the fine arts, they think of good art requiring high skill. And that's true, but high skill means nothing if there's no creativity and no vision and no motivation behind it. I am going to make it through this year. Um, 
it's no different than someone can draw a lifelike picture and that's skillful and it is art but it's more of the history and the motivation and the context of the art you can't directly compare someone's uh portrait drawing to a jackson pollock for example or a mark rothko or a damien hurst or something like that and so what this band is is an imperfect band the uh lead singer josh darnielle is um has a voice that reminds me a lot of like jeff mangum of neutral milk hotel two one two three four It's abrasive, it's flawed, it's screeching, but he sings in a way that's very, very powerful. All right, I'm on Johnson Avenue in San Luis Obispo, and I'm five years old or six, maybe. And indications that there's something wrong with our new house. Trip down the wire twice daily. I'm in the living room watching the Watergate hearings while my stepfather yells at my mother. Launches a glass across the room, straight at her head, and I dash upstairs to take cover, lean in close to my little record player on the floor. So this is what the volume knobs for. I listen to dance music, dance music. The words that he's saying just create vivid images in your mind. They tell stories that are interesting and much like uh, when you read a story um, and you can kind of put yourself in a character's position um, or you can kind of view things from a character's perspective. He does a great job of making you feel and be in a place like he is. And a lot of that, in my opinion, has to do with the fact that he's not a perfect singer, that he's not uh a brilliant vocalist in the sense of like he's not going to win a singing competition right he's not you know um he's not uh josh groban he's not uh, or any of these kind of people right he's not like uh he's not usher or anything like that but it comes across as coming from a place of pure intent and pure in the sense of authentic and uh, he sings a lot about uh, his own personal experiences everything from growing up in an abusive home uh, being addicted to drugs and alcohol as a teenager living in the suburbs of uh, Texas um, professional wrestling of all things because that was a big influence on him born down in El Paso where the tumbleweeds blow the middleweight champ of all Mexico. Dad fought many bloody battles, and he raised four sons. Chavo was the oldest one. Old man Gory could pop like a live grenade. Raised his boys in the way of the trade. Hector and Mondo, young Eddie G. Chavo meant the most to me. Look high, it's my last hope. He's also gone on to write novels, uh, and if you want a really great uh, interview with him, he did an interview with Terry Gross on Fresh Air a few years ago, and that's the first place I had ever heard of him. Um, and ever since I heard this song, No Children... We come up with a fail-safe plot to piss off the dumb few that forgave us. I hope the fences we mended fall down beneath their own weight. And I hope we hang on past the last exit. I hope it's already too late. And I hope the junkyard a few blocks from here 
someday burns down And I hope the rising black smoke carries me far away And I never come back to this town again In my life I hope I lie And tell everyone you were a good wife And I hope you die I hope we both die I have been completely just in, in captured by this artist. So if you do like what you hear, if you like if you like music that bridge that somewhere is between like folk and indie rock, um, with a very like imperfect sound, a very raw sound, highly recommend the Mountain Goats and uh, Josh Darnio. And I hope you blink before I do. And I hope I never get sober. And I hope when you think of me years down the line, you can't find one good thing to say. And I'd hope that if I found the strength to walk out, you'd stay the hell out of my way. I am drowning. There is no sign of land. You are coming down with me. Hand in unlovable hand. And I hope you die. I hope we both die. All right, so uh, let's talk about movies. Uh, I feel more comfortable talking about movies uh, than I do about music and books. Music and books, I feel like it's more just like my personal taste, things that are interesting me. Uh, films, I feel like I've watched a lot of them and I've really gone on my way to learn a lot about them. And I feel like I'm more knowledgeable about film and movies than I am about other subjects. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two movies. Uh, the first one is gonna be my classic film. And the first film is actually a samurai film called Harakiri. The reason I thought about this film was someone recently uh, asked me if I could recommend a samurai film to them because Ghost of Tsushima came out, you know, influence and just kind of wanting to see more of what the genre, the Jidai Geki uh, samurai classic films uh, were like. Because you have your classics, Seven Samurai, Rashomon, Yojimbo, Sanjuro. Um, you even have like Sword of Doom, uh, the Zatoichi films, etc. And this film came out the same year as the first Zatoichi film and only and within the same like few years as Yojimbo, Sanjuro and Hidden Fortress. It's less known in the populace, but it is probably, in my opinion, the best of all of those that I listed. What it is, is it's a film by Masaki Kobayashi about a man who goes to his local feudal lord and asks him if he can commit harakiri or seppuku or ritualistic suicide in front of him with his permission uh but only if he can tell his story first and the story is about revenge it's about um honor and what it does that a lot of other samurai films don't do is it uses the bushido code as a narrative tool um, or not necessarily a narrative to, but tool, but like an actual, like it's, it's important to the plot. And not only that, it um, it also is a film that mostly takes place in this one courtyard with him telling the story. There are flashbacks, there are uh, other scenes that we go to, um, especially involving the story that he's telling. Um, but it's not a traditional narrative structure. It's not Act One, Act Two, Act Three. 
they're in there somewhere. Um, it, it almost feels like there's a prologue, an act, another movie almost within that act, and then a conclusion, a dramatic conclusion. It, it's very strange, but in my opinion, it's one of the best told stories to come out of Japan as far as uh, the Jidai Geki uh, genre. It's up there with Rashomon for me, uh, with Rashomon being the highest standard when it comes to non-traditional narrative. A lot of what we consider tropes in those films are in this film, but they weren't necessarily tropes at the time. The blowing grass, sword duels, and things like that. You can thank this movie in large part for a lot of that. It's kind of long, roughly two and a half hours or so, but it is, there's moments in this that actually remind me a lot of like uh, a lot of minimalistic films. Uh, the film like recently Marriage Story or something like that, where um, it's just about people interacting in, in a small environment or in a very, um, in a very sparse environment. There's not big dramatic, it's not like Seven Samurai where there's these sweeping action shots and huge sets and uh, just swords clashing battles. There's just a lot of tension involved in the history between people and what's going on between them and why they've mer why they've kind of coalesced into this moment together. Um, it, it's absolutely wonderful. It's if you are a fan of classic samurai films and you don't want some if you want something more refined and less pulpy, this is it. This is absolutely it. It's amazing. Can't recommend it enough. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about a contemporary film that I like. Uh, this is a film called Neon Demon. You know what my mother used to call me? Dangerous. Uh, with Neon Demon, I am definitely in a minority or at least... It's a very divisive film, so I'm in the side that likes it. And there's a lot of people that don't like it, and I'll talk about why. But it's by director Nicholas Winding Rift, who is the director of Bronson, uh, and more famously uh, directed Drive, the movie with Ryan Gosling in it. There's 100,000 streets in this city. So you just moved to LA? No, I've been here for a while. And much like Drive, this is a film that's very, very... Um, very heavily weighted with uh, really captivating soundtrack music uh, and probably Nicholas Winding Ref's strongest suit, just beautiful cinematography and framing of subjects. It's definitely a movie that is more of an experience than a strong plot the plot in it is actually very basic girl goes to hollywood to become a model becomes a model and a bunch of bad things happen to her because it's the modeling industry um one of the critiques i've heard about this film is that it's um mansplaining the model industry and in a lot of ways i get that opinion uh, for me, I think it's more of a priorities thing. I'm not the kind of person that needs a very strong narrative and all this other stuff alongside with it. Um, it, it if one of them's strong and very strong, then I can overlook a lot of maybe uh, um, a lot of other things like a more basic story. Um, and this is a movie that is surreal, beautifully shot. It, it's an experience more than it is a captivating story uh and i have lots of films that i love that are like that um where it, it's more about watching and kind of being surrounded by the movie and letting the movie take you over and not necessarily sitting there watching a story understanding the story and that's a lot of it right 
it, it's the visuals in this movie are really fascinating because they take high-end fashion models which we as a society whether we mean to or not put on a certain high pedestal and they feel kind of out of reach of us in a lot of ways as far as our goals for ourselves and our appearance and lifestyle and things like that and they're framed in a way where they feel alien and otherworldly a lot of times this movie just evokes something in me when i watch it um i think that drive is a bit overrated and i think that at the i think that it's fair that drive and this are about on equal grounds i think that drive story is very simple we've seen it before we've heard it before but people overlook that because of the atmosphere and the tone and the aesthetics that it has. And I feel like you can do the same with Neon Demon if you really let yourself. Um, to top it off, it also has one of the best Keanu Reeves appearances ever. He plays a sleazy voyeuristic landlord and he's absolutely fantastic in it. Um, the one thing I will say about this film is, other than this plot being very simple kind of predictable is the last 25 20 percent of the movie is not predictable and it comes out of left field and it is it's like watching it's almost like watching up until that point just kind of a melodrama and then for the last 20 to 25 percent of it it just suddenly becomes a almost like an exploitation film um in like a macabre dark just very interesting way a way that i can see a lot of people not liking but if you see it and you know what i'm talking about you might see why i liked it i thought that that was an interesting way to end the movie um the movie can be sophomoric i get it but that doesn't prevent me from really enjoying it again I'm the kind of person that I can turn my mind off a bit if the story is a little simple and just embrace all the other things that a movie does right. And this movie does a lot of things right. I am dangerous. There you go, guys. There's a couple of movies and some music and a book that I like uh, for the month. Uh, I hope that it gives you a little bit of insight into kind of what I'm up to and what I'm liking this month. Uh, I will keep making more of these. Uh, maybe I'll make some more specific, especially to film since that's kind of my Balawick. Uh, but uh, I hope you guys liked it. I hope you guys kind of get to know me a little bit from it and maybe you saw something that you like. Um, but I will see you guys when I go live the next video or some other time. Uh, awkward end of the video. <laughs>